Afternoon greetings to everyone. And you have heard that the storm was here. The storm continues to be here. We are African women. And what are we doing? We are taking the world by storm. So we are glad. We are glad that you have returned from lunch and you have joined us for our afternoon session. And have, I have some great, great news for you. Are you ready for this? Miss Joey Cole, our long anticipated MC, has arrived. The storm did not stop her. Joey Cole is right here, and you may have seen her on MSNBC, where she is a senior producer. Do you know that she has two Emmys, not one, but two Emmys? Following as an award-winning individual, when she was here at Wellesley College, she graduated with honors, of course. Absolutely. And so now she is here to join us as our conference MC, and we are so glad that the storm did not stop her. Please join me in welcoming our MC, Ms. Joey Cole. I am so happy to be here. Um, as you guys know, the storm, it was a bit of a trek, but I was like determined. I'm like, I'm a Wellesley woman. Nothing is gonna stop me from being here. <laughs> um, so I will um, move on with the afternoon session. I just wanna thank Elizabeth for your kind words and also Karen and the whole Slater International Center team for putting this together. It has been a phenomenal experience for me to work with them. Uh, I also wanted to thank President Johnson and Cameron Mason for extending the invitation for me to be here. So I'm gonna move into our afternoon portion and the next session is titled Women Leaders in Health. This session will look at a crucial role of African female healthcare providers and how they play a role in the development and advancement in research and medicine within the continent. It is my great honor to introduce the moderator for this session. Please, a round of applause for Dr. Paula Johnson, the 14th president of Wellesley College. Thank you, Joey. Thank you, Joey. Um, I am uh, so thrilled that you made it. Um, even though sometimes it can be easier to get here from across the ocean than from New York City. <laughs> um, but I'd like to welcome you to today's presentation by one of the leading innovators in the arena of global health, a champion for health and, and a leader in strengthening healthcare systems. Um, we are so greatly honored to have with us today Dr. Anyaz Benawahu, and she's asked me, or asked us, that we call her Dr. Agnes. She's speaking to us today on the topic of the challenges faced by African women leaders in the health sector. Dr. Agnes is a staunch advocate for the importance of HIV treatment and prevention. She has won the prestigious Rue Award and is recognized and acclaimed for her effective use of data to improve and strengthen Rwanda's healthcare system. Throughout her distinguished career and through practicing inclusive healthcare policies that leave no one out, she has insisted that health, physical, mental, and social is a human right for all, something we can clearly learn from in our own country. Dr. Agnes, for almost 15 years, from 2002 to 2016, held leadership roles in the Rwandan health sector. First, as the executive sector, secretary of Rwanda's National AIDS Control Commission. Next, as permanent secretary of the Minister of Health. And finally, as the Minister of Health. Currently, she's vice chancellor as well as Professor of the Practice of Global Health Delivery for the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda. This is an institution that seeks to educate and train 
future generations of healthcare workers to serve communities affected by poverty across Africa and beyond. She is also a senior lecturer in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School and an adjunct clinical professor of pediatrics at Dartmouth School of Medicine. She earned her doctorate of philosophy from the University of Rwanda College of Business and Economics and Dartmouth has awarded her an honorary doctor of science degree. It's perhaps her successful interventions over the years that speak most powerfully about Dr. Agnes. As part of the work that earned her the Rue Prize, her data analysis revealed that a significant number of Rwandas were dying not long after childbirth. These findings prompted her and she and her team to push for more equipment and training in the area of neonatal and maternal health, which ultimately succeeded in successfully decreasing the number of neonatal deaths. Partnering with the American pharmaceutical company Merck, she fought to provide girls in her country with HPV vaccines in order to decrease their rate of cervical cancer. Today, roughly 93% of eligible girls receive vaccines. This is an enviable, enviable accomplishment. When she led Rwanda's National AIDS Control Commission, she and her team cultivated public, private, and community sector partnerships with the goal of improving HIV care for everyone. The United Nations has reported that the number of people dying from HIV annually fell from 15,000 to 7,700. Now that's a 44% decrease in six years, and new infections were cut in half. During her time in Rwanda's Ministry of Health, the ministry trained 45,000 people as community health workers to help provide care to the country's poorest communities. Life expectancy rose from 28 years in 1994 to 56 years in 2012. In addition to improving outcomes in areas of public health and infectious disease, Dr. Agnes has been a leader in addressing chronic disease in Rwanda. In 2012, while she was Rwanda's Minister of Health, she worked with Partners in Health, the Jeff Gordon Children's Foundation, and Harvard's Dana-Farber Brigham Women's Cancer Center to open the first comprehensive cancer referral facility in rural East Africa. The Butaro Cancer Center of Excellence offers a spectrum of oncology, diagnostic, and treatment services, including chemotherapy, surgery, a pathology lab, counseling, and palliative care. And I just wanna to say to you that this is, this is truly breakthrough and revolutionary. Um, as we tend to think of, of countries in the developing world as only focused on infectious disease, whereas chronic disease is increasing rampantly. I know of Dr. Agnes's work personally, and when I was at Harvard Medical School and ran a fellowship for Global Women's Health, we had trainees in Rwanda sent to learn how to develop, to develop public health driven health systems based on data and rooted in the belief that health is a human right. And as I said earlier, something that we hoped with our young trainees, they would bring back to the United States. Dr. Agnes is a woman of formidable spirit, focused vision, and a commanding intellect. It has been said of her, and I quote, throughout her life, she has been unafraid to defy authority by speaking her mind, and in the process, she has helped to, transformed, to transform Rwanda's health system. We are deeply honored to have Dr. Agnes with us today. Dr. Agnes Benawahu. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, young leaders. Good afternoon. Yes, with energy. I really appreciate the session of this morning because you have shown what the world can expect from you. And I'm proud to be your big sister. <laughs> so 
I have today to talk to you about Africa, about women, about health and leaders. And I'm going to start by Africa. And you can see that we, the women of Africa, the world, try, the world which is a spicy world, try to trap us by those words. First of all, how Africa is portrayed is already a fake news. In this country, they know how it's a fake news. You can see that they show that we are small, why we are so big. The visualization of Africa try to make us like that when we are so big. That's the first thing. Second, so many issues in the UN talk about Africa, isn't it? We don't have a permanent representation there. And they talk about us. And we have to be careful because where we are not on the table, where are we? On the menu. <laughs> so Africa is misrepresented. Africa is underrepresented. But we also need to know that it's not only outside Africa that it's wrong. Inside Africa, we are not doing well either. 20% of parliamentarians only are women. Uh -huh. We are 50%, more than 50% of the population, isn't it? Yeah. Across the world, we are more than the men. Because the really strong sex is us. It's not a joke. Biologically, there is more fetus survival for men. Newborn survival for men. Work position, male. That's something wrong. Also, it's not only in Africa. You have in Asia, you can see, the representation of women is also really unequal. This morning, we were talking about what is not correct in Africa. But I like that we are here, multicultural and multiracial, because this is a problem. That is a global problem. And we will not solve it in Africa if we don't give a hand to each other across the world. It's the same in Asia. It is the same also in Europe. And if you look now back to Africa and globally, you have the decision makers. We are already lit a little number. You have the <coughs> African decision makers. And among them, you have the women. And there, we almost disappear. Huh? You see this branch, what is not a big one? African global decision makers, and now the women. But I'm sure things are changing. You have seen the new director executive of the WHO. He has nominated his cabinet 50, more than 50% of women, 60%. However, it's just the first step. Because if we just do at that level, it's not enough. We need to revisit the entire institution. Why is it like that? I told you, Africa, and this morning you have pointed out, Africa is the, country, country, the continent of misery, is the continent of poverty, etc. Hmm? Why well, you have said Africa is full of riches. Africa has an history we could be proud of. Remember our history, the empire of Mali with Tombuktu, the first university. That was Alexandria, the first university. It was in our continent. They tried to tell the world that we were not, we, we didn't know how to write and read. First, before the pharaoh and those pyramids, in Zambia, who is coming from Zambia? 
there was somebody this morning. We found that people there knew how to write before the Egyptian. But this, you will find it nowhere. The German who found it buried that information. And as you said, we need to go ourselves to rewrite and to do again a true narrative. So Africa, now the fact that you are a woman, Women across the world are not well seen. I don't want to talk about the Me Too campaign here that is more than needed. Hmm? And somebody was telling me one day, before the colonial time, at the time of, of my grand-grandmother, our girls were, were, were going naked up. Nobody was touching. Isn't it? Now you try to put everything, and they try to touch anyway. <laughs> huh? Isn't it? There's something wrong in the world where we live now. But thanks to girls and women like you, we are going to change it. So the layers of bias are Africa, being a woman, and also being a woman in global health. So, again, you talked this morning about the high position women have in government. The Minister of Social Affairs is always a woman, but social protection is already like this, isn't it? Except that when there is a true political will. In Rwanda we have 60, more than 60% women in parliament. You know how it come from? It came from not, we never fought, fight for this, or fought for this. It was a political decision by the ruling party that if they won the war, they will change the gender balance and the gender issue. Give positive, and positive discrimination to push the woman at poor position. However, we face a problem. When this the political decision was taken, the woman, majority of women didn't went to school. English became our first language, the second language after Kenya Rwanda. Many of them didn't speak English. Many of elected women never learned how to do a law. Many of them elected to parliament didn't know how a parliament was working. And those are the reasons why power is refused elsewhere. The decision was we freeze everything and we teach them. They are elected by the people because the people trust them. Let's take the time to teach them English. Let's give them the time to teach them how we do a law. And it worked. And don't believe that all the men in Rwanda are good men. Huh? <laughs> no, 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 no. And they were saying, huh, we will see if you do better than us. And we answer, you, will, you, you, you never doubt that you were good, but you were not. So give us a chance. We took the chance, and it worked. But you can see that in the majority of Africa, it's not the same. And even in, in Europe, and this because of the tradition that are not created before the colonial time. We got this morning a piece of history of Africa. I love a professor, where are you? <laughs> the piece of history you give talks volume that there is something anthropologic study that we should study. We should study why. Things have changed and when? Because native Indian is the same. If you go to the traditional population in Europe before the Roman, it was the same, the Celt and others. So there is something that changed. And where men 
to take the power, have to deny that to women. And it's something we see now. Because you can, we can say traditional chief, there were women, etc. We had the mother king, but we had to fight now to keep this woman position that exists traditionally. So, yeah, we had to fight. And we have to give a hand. Because if we go to the, 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 the traditional empire, it, the woman, even if we go to the pharaoh, Cleopatra was a queen. Fully queen, isn't it? Yes. Beautiful, fully queen. That's what Caesar say. We never saw her. But. <laughs> In global health now, you can see that 84% of women are there. But when we go in leadership position, it's totally reversed. Could you do the proportion of that? It's insane. It's insane. We don't, we don't have more than 25% of leadership position in global health when we are more than 84%. And this is globally. It's not only in Africa. I was a minister of health, and I went in many assemblies where there was the majority of men. And it's still like that. We should have 50% in everything. And even the 30% that is guaranteed by my constitution is not enough. Why 30% when we are 50%? The, why missing 20% of rights should be the proportion that we are in the population. So I have given a portion of the response of the source of these disparities. It started at Kidden Garden. The education of women at primary school. And if you have colleagues that are men, just tell them that is really miscalculation. Studies have shown that educating, educating women, you have healthiest families, and it makes your GDP grow. And you can count. Those slides have the reference of the article that I took. Nothing I say is guessing. It's the reality and peer review publications. We can calculate the loss of GDP of a country because they don't educate women. Is it dramatic when we are underdeveloped? It is. And some country lost more than one billion dollar, more than what we can dream to have for health, for social, services, etc. And there is a lot of things we can do. And so many things start by what you are doing. And I'm so proud, MasterCard, bravo. Educate more women. <laughs> this morning, there was the question, woman, woman, we neglect men. And we don't neglect men. We don't. We have to have a fair share. We don't have to decrease the number of men that are educated. We need to increase the number of schools so we can feed them with, with women. We don't have to create other imbalance. But women, it's, it's a matter of a development for all with gender equity. So, the lady of agriculture, I love you. I tweeted you, because what you say is great. We need women in science. And you, you can see how we self-select where we go. I did medicine because I love it. But many young girls are educated with the sense that science is for men. It's for the boys. Isn't it? Yes. And you will see that are some article who just say the contrary. Women are better in science than boys. 
And the way we are looked at, the way we are nurtured by our parents, our communities, just direct us for, to social and just say science, mathematics, and technology is for the boys. The day we will fight that with success, it will change a lot. Now there is another thing. When we were working, in many places in the world, we don't have the same salary. This is, I'm sure it is constitutionally wrong. I'm sure all constitution of all country in the world are fighting this. You'll see also that in academia, the chance for women is not the same as the chance for men. And this morning, Professor, you talk about Simone de Beauvoir, who theorized the fact that because we give birth, we are incommodated during a couple of months, and after that we deliver in a lot of pain, and after that we have to breastfeed, and two years pass on, and the men during that time have their career taking off because they are young, active, and they are not waking up for the baby who cry. They are not going to the hospital with the baby sick. And the career of the woman is behind, isn't it? What if we decide that each academia, in academia, each pregnant woman nature a Nobel Prize? Mantle a Nobel Prize. And get advancement for that. And at least what she, do during the, she does during that time can double. Yeah. In fact, laws are made by us, changed by us. In the university where we are, we are going to change that. Every baby that will be produced by an academic lady will consider as mentorship of a Nobel Prize. Mm hmm I have my board there. Is it adopted, Ophelia? Yeah! <laughs> All of you, is, you are witnesses. Huh? <laughs> but that's true that we need to have the right to have a family, the right to produce children, and the right to be in our career and develop it. Isn't it? We need to find a balance, and the system has to find a balance to do that. So, there is something else. You know that when we are women, and we produce article, and when there are a bunch of men who are producing it, they are not considered the same way. When it's a man, the probability to be published is higher. So it's not only that in our tradition, in our culture, in our home, in our education, in our work, we have other salaries. When we produce scientific work, it's more difficult for us, even worse. <coughs> when an university recruits a lot of women, some see that as a decrease in quality. Do you know that? There are publications about it. So, in the health sector also, you can see that women, we are always there to care, to provide services. In Rwanda, as President Johnson told you, we have 45,000 community health workers, three per village, two women, one man. And you see the balance there. There's one woman for, for following pregnancy and ch children, if, uh, before one year, and two others, a man and a woman, for other problem, health problems, or for other health prevention. However, when we continue, and we start talking about educated health professionals, then everything changed. And you can see, I will point it here, 
only 5% of women. So we have the, the biggest number of women in parliament. This is an achievement. But we have only 5% of women that are head of hospital. Only 12% of specialists that are doctor, the uh, female doctors. And only 12% of women that are MD. And this is where the work is a handicap considered to gender when you are a young woman. And it's more than political. We need to change the culture. The woman need to be safe if she doesn't want to have a kid, or she doesn't want to have a kid that year. The, the family-in-law should not be in her back and say, when are you going to produce the baby? <laughs> huh? You know that. You know, five years before menopause, I told my, my, my family-in-law I menopause so that they stopped to <laughs> bother me. <laughs> Say, too late. <laughs> no. Nursing, the majority are women. Doctors, especially, the majority are men. That's something wrong. Hmm? But there are good news. What we have achieved in Parliament is good. For male president in Africa, it's good. We have a big number, nine. Hmm? Of course, in between, there is a lot of things to change. And <laughs> this you say this morning, Professor among the country with the biggest number of women in parliament. Ah, you came near. <laughs> Africa lead the way. So there is a lot of things, and this part of our history is embedded in us. I think we can revigorate that and even do more, even if there is a lot to do. We have an average the biggest number of women in parliament, but this number is really so little. Those are the details. I told you that scientific work, there is uh, in the British Medical Journal, there was a publication three months ago showing that for the same disease, same condition, when the surgeon is a woman, you have more chance to have to survive and more chance to have to have no complication. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Start to be interesting, huh? So we need innovation and think out of the box to really give to the, the woman the position that we deserve. We need, I'm talking about health to break geographic barrier, financial barrier, but gender barrier. In many countries, even when you talk about agriculture, even when the woman bring the, 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 the wealth in the family by her work, she gives the money to the man and she has to beg for her and her children when she's sick or the children are sick, isn't it? We need to change that. Hmm? And we count on you, the young, pop, the young generation, to change it. And all of us, we have in our culture, in our tradition, what it takes to find the good word to change the mentalities. Hmm? And I'm not, I don't want to be too controversial, <laughs> a little bit anyway, <laughs> but this religion who told us that there is a lady who take, take an apple from a a tree and give that to the poor man who was almost obliged to die to eat it. Huh? <laughs> and we were all thrown out of the paradise. And because of that, we are going to have baby with a lot of, uh, of pain, etc. Bullshit. We are strong women. So many good things have been done by women. Certainly nothing to do with an apple. <laughs> mm. 
So, my personal journey, I'm here for two days. I will talk to you about it. This, we, we have a lunch uh, together. She asks us what to do. I just say, find your passion. Fight for it. Be ready to die for it. Yes. It gives you life. And never believe that because you study mathematics or agriculture, you'll do mathematics and agriculture all your life. Never. You want to do that to a poor woman, all along your way, you'll find a better way to employ a woman, and you end I don't know what. If some, someday, it, when I was young, somebody will tell me that I will be minister, I will laugh dying, maybe, because it's impossible. I'm too politically incorrect. <laughs> but I came there just to make sure to find the drugs for the kids I want to save. Hmm? So the journey you have will be guided by your passion. Be passionate is the best fuel for your life. And now, if somebody will told me that one day I will create with friends the best university on earth, I don't talk about this college, but we will be better. <laughs> <laughs> but we are going to partner to change the world. Now we are creating an university to transfer those skills mm -hmm. for young people and less young people to go across the world and manage health sector so that they do the maximum with the little money they have, leaving no one out, with a special focus to the poor and the vulnerable, those who are voiceless. And we turn gender inequity, we turn the relation that exists in teams meaning the nurse is less valuable than the doctor, the community health workers less valuable than the nurse. Mm -mm. We learn, teach people how to work in, in a team. Yes, one minute, okay. And we teach girls that science is for, her, for them. So, huge is our university, huge. University of Global Health Equity. So which we want to revolutionize how health science are taught. We have graduated our first class and we are going to graduate the next one soon. We, our objective is we educate in rural area because the majority of the world live in rural area and the majority of school, medical school, are in rural area and so that our students will be pleased to stay and serve where the people are. Wow. Dr. Añez, uh, just thank you for that inspirational talk and for your inspiration. Um, I think you give us hope that, as another famous alumna said, that the impossible is possible. And um, I'd love for you to talk to us a little bit about the journey to creating the University of Global Health Equity, because that is truly powerful. Usually when we think about health equity, it is some subsection of medicine. It is some portion that lives in, um, in a different place than what is considered the general aspects of medicine. You, with your partners, have really made this the core yeah. of what you were doing, with this, which is really revolutionary. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey to, to start the university? So this university, the other co-founder is uh, Paul Farmer. A big player is there called Ophelia. Stand up, Ophelia. <laughs> Ophelia Dahl, another Wellesley alumna <laughs> and co-founder of Partners in Health. She's totally blonde, thin, but she's my sister. Yeah. <laughs> so what we did, uh, we have the same philosophy. And this is what was, I apply in my day-to-day work. I, I told you I'm a pediatrician. 
And I came back in Rwanda in 96 when there is a lot of HIV AIDS, people were dying like that. And I start being a clinician, but I can't do, the, I, I was not able to do much. Up to the time, I was proposed to run the program of the First Lady. In the beginning, I said, no, I'm not a program manager. I don't never know where is my money, etc. I'm going to, to mess up everything. But I was explained, your problem is the drugs. In that position, you'll find the medicine for the kids. I say, I take the job immediately. And taking the job, when we start to bring drugs, but not for all, how to choose who to save? And make sure that the vulnerable has the same chance to be safe than the one, than my own kids, for example. And to do that, for me, I had to invent system. I had the chance to be very inventive. And why I really embrace and love working with partner in health, they had the same philosophy. And why everything I did was successful is because I was always targeting the most poor in, of the community. Meaning when I was doing a program, I was doing the program to make sure that the poor is not left out. With this, the rich came and find their way. So I used to say, I do my work when the, the, the grandchild of the, the poorest grandma is safe. Then my child is safe. And then I have success. So, and this bring principle, we have studied with Paul Farmer at Harvard. And those are the principles of global health. We, talk, but, but we have implemented. Mm -hmm. We have found that through implementation. And we teach integration, coordination, advocacy. Don't believe that uh, I can say the apple is, uh, mm, but I'm a very good advocate. Not, a, not traditionally, but I get what I need. <laughs> and we teach that to, the, to, to the, the student. All those skills that are needed to be an entrepreneurial health system builder. That is wonderful. I'm going to ask you one more question before we open it up. And um, you're teaching now at the university really a, a way of framing health, looking of health, that is broad. You must think about the total person. And you really have to develop a skills, a set of skills that are not just narrowly defined as medical, yeah. but are really across sectors. Yeah. When I think about you as the minister of health, Without a doubt, you had to get the money from somewhere. Yep. You had to work with the Minister of Finance. You had to build a number of skills in other areas. Tell us a little bit about, did you even have a, a notion that you had those skills, or how did that develop? Um, it's, it's an advocacy skills that you need to develop. At a certain point, you need the money or the people are going to die. Mm -hmm. So you became very imaginative, isn't it? It's like when you are 14 and you need to go somewhere and you need the parents to say yes. You are very imaginative, isn't it? <laughs> so it's the same skill huh? for something else. And for the Minister of Finance, you need to learn to speak finance. Yeah. With the Minister of Agriculture, you need to, 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 to learn how to talk potatoes and micronutrients, <laughs> etc. So. You see, in this presentation, the GDP that we won when we have this, and we did, I did the same. So that means I need $300,000 for a vaccine. I need to prove how many lives I'm going to save, how many days of uh, economic production the parents are not going to lose, and make a financial case, and make him buy my case. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Um, let's come, oh, we stop, okay, <laughs> thank you. Dr. Añez, thank you for all that you have brought, not only to Rwanda, but to the world, and what you are bringing to us here um, at the African Women's Leadership Conference, and to all of our young people who clearly see in you uh, as an example of what is possible. So. 
always go for the most vulnerable and always say impossible is not in my vocabulary. And you'll make it. Thank you.